Manatee County. Deputies there investigating after finding an 18-year-old dead in a pool of blood. They say a driver spotted the body of Alexander Anderson along First Avenue in Palmetto just before midnight. Detectives say it appears he was shot to death. So far, no arrests and no word on any side. An update to the breaking news in El Cajon, where police arrested a dozen protesters overnight. 10 News reporter Candace Crone there live with what led to those arrests. And just within the last 10 minutes, a few members of the Grove Church showed up here at El Cajon Police Department. As you can see, they're praying. They said that they just kind of came out here at the last minute to pray in light of the shooting of Alfred Alongo and the recent protests. Now, let's take a look at some video from overnight. 12 demonstrators were arrested after they refused to leave the scene where Alongo was shot and killed by police. We've also learned that four other people were arrested for alcohol-related crimes, and one person was taken into custody on an unrelated arrest warrant. Police say they pulled over a car that was leaving the protest, but they ended up arresting that driver for drunken driving and being under 21. Two other people in that car were also arrested for being drunk in public. Well, a fight broke out at some point between protesters, and shortly after, police declared an unlawful assembly. That's when officers arrested those 12 people who refused to leave. On Tuesday, Alongo's sister called 911 because he had a mental breakdown. Police arrived and say the man pulled out a vaping device out of his pants and took a shooting stance. Officer Richard Gonzalez fired his gun, killing Alongo. Well, that sparked protests for the last several days. Now, people have also been protesting here at police headquarters, but we've been out here this afternoon, and so far things have been peaceful. We're live in El Cajon, Candace Crone. That breaking news, fire forcing evacuations at a South Bay strip mall. Good evening, I'm Riel Creighton. The fire at Northgate Gonzalez Market in Otay Mesa is now out. 10 News reporter Jessica Chen, they're live where the stores just reopened. And hours later, you can see SDG&E is still here on site cleaning up this area. Now, in terms of the fire, this is where it started. You can see the burned materials just strewn everywhere. Now, the fire started near this Gatch electric system, and you can see there is somebody here working on replacing a new one. Now, the flames got dangerously close to businesses that crews had to evacuate the shops around 2 this morning. Customers and workers at the North Gate Gonzalez Market Plaza on Coronado Avenue were asked to step outside for at least 30 minutes. The fire department put out the fire behind the strip mall and turned off the gas. A woman we spoke to says it all happened so fast. They came and they kind of just like they, you know, they noticed that it was a lot of fire. So they're like, you know what, everybody out. So as soon as like they came and they were just like rushing everybody out. Like Again, SDG&E still out here cleaning up this area. In terms of the businesses at this strip mall, it is all back to normal now. In Otay Mesa, Jessica Chen. New information in the hit and run crash that killed a Lyft driver on Saturday morning. That driver now identified as Henry Reyes. The news reporter Matt Mendez is live at the airport where fellow drivers are honoring him. Real, this is just a heartbreaking story. Lyft and Uber drivers here near the airport waiting to pick up passengers can feel the loss. They've even started a memorial. You can see here some pink ribbons tied to the fence, a pink rose, also some candles. Memorial for that Lyft driver killed yesterday. And the medical examiner's office has identified him as Henry Reyes of Escondido. He died early Saturday morning on his birthday. This is video of that scene. He was driving three women home from the downtown area. That's when one woman began vomiting in his back seat. So he pulled over on the 94 freeway on the shoulder there in the Golden Hill area. That's when another driver hit him and his car and then tried taking off. Reyes died at the scene. The three women were taken to the hospital. We don't know how they're doing. But the tragedy has not only rocked the Lyft and Uber community, but is also putting safety at the forefront of drivers' minds. It's a sign to, you know, to pay attention to what you're doing. For sure. Yeah, it reinforces it, but it also makes it very real. Uh, realistically, yeah. you, you know it's a possibility that you can get in an accident or get hurt. And CHP arrested two men who were in the other car. They tried taking off after the crash. A police helicopter helped capture them. And we've called CHP to find out those men's names and also their charges. We're still waiting to hear back. We'll, of course, let you know once we do. We're live at Lindbergh Field. Matt, so here's the latest on to Matthew. 130 mile an hour winds uh, still looking at this northerly movement, but you can see the thunderstorm activity associated uh, with Matthew and the heavy rain already impacting with Haiti. We're there. They're expecting 
potential feet of uh, rainfall there. So that is going to be devastating for them. Threading uh, here between uh, Cuba and uh, Haiti. And in fact, the forecast has it making landfall across uh, Guantanamo, the base there, as we've been talking about evacuations. And then it heads into the uh, Bahamas by late Tuesday and into Wednesday. Then it makes its closest pass to us through Thursday and into Friday. As you can see, it kind of paralleling the coast there. We're basically out of the cone, but just keep checking back in case this moves a little bit further to the west and the impacts would be more significant across the east coast. Uh, but right now, uh, we have to watch this very closely for the Carolinas. You can see the computer model forecast uh, kind of taking it uh, in that direction. They're still trying to ex understand exactly what happened last Thursday at the Hoboken train terminal. That's where Thursday an NJ transit train crashed into the station, injuring more than 100, killing one person. News 12 New Jersey's Tony Caputo in Hoboken with more. Tony. You know, it was right after this accident where anyone and everyone started asking how did it happen? What exactly happened on the tracks that day to cause this fatal accident Thursday morning? With National Transportation Safety Board officials telling us that NJ Transit engineer Thomas Gallagher reported for work Thursday fully rested, cell phone turned off and put away. He told authorities he checked the brakes and alerter. Everything was working normally. However, he says he remembered everything right up to the moment he pulled into the station. Even with that information, investigators steadfast and refraining from any speculation, relying instead on the event recorders. Now, one was already salvaged. It was salvaged from the rear of the locomotive, which was built back in 1995. But NTSB Vice Chairwoman Bella Dinzar said that won't help. Yesterday, our recorders experts worked with the experts from the manufacturers to access data from the recovered locomotive event recorder, which was built in 1995. Unfortunately, the event recorder was not functioning during this trip. Now she says there's another forward facing event recorder. It's still buried beneath the rubble in the first car. They're hoping that it will be working and hold some key answers for them. Now legally, that lead cab must have an operating recorder. We'll see how that pans out. The vice chairwoman adds investigators will use information from the Federal Railroad Administration that found several New Jersey transit safety violations. However, it will still conduct its own fully independent investigation. You see out here in Hoboken now, Lackawanna Station, of course, uh, dem demolition has begun and the old train station will continue 24 hours a day until it is completed. Try and get things up and running as normally as possible, as soon as possible. But again, right now, everybody wondering what exactly led to this deadly crash last week. We're live in Hoboken. Tony Caputo, News 12, New Jersey. We'll send it back to you. In Peoria, an infant dead after possibly being left in a car for hours. This happening at an apartment complex near Peoria and 83rd Avenues. ABC 15's Raquel Cervantes is live at the Peoria Police Headquarters. And Raquel, tonight we're learning that neighbors tried to step in to help. Yeah, that's right. And a neighbor tells me that she tried to perform CPR on the infant, but she says it was too late. The infant not breathing died at the hospital. And now police are investigating how this happened. Peoria police are having this car towed away where they believe a five-month-old baby boy was left alone for several hours before a caretaker brought the infant inside already in distress. The child was not breathing upon our arrival. Um, at that point, the child was transported to the hospital where the little boy was pronounced deceased. This neighbor, who didn't want to be named, says she tried to help, but the baby was already turning blue. My kids come down and said that this baby needs help. I ran in, attempted to do CPR, but no success. Police say it's unknown just how long the baby was alone in the car or what the two caretakers were doing in the meantime. But at some point, one of them got the baby out and called 911 with the neighbor. The baby was already in the home, laying on the table. I attempted to do CPR. There was no need for it. The baby was only five months old, way too young to die. Now, police say that the baby's parents have been notified of his death. Two caretakers are in custody for questioning by police pending any possible charges. And right now, the exact relationship of the caretakers to the inf infant is unclear. Reporting in Peoria, Raquel Cervantes, ABC 15 News. Matthew could bring catastrophic damage to the Caribbean islands before threatening the U.S. The dangerous storm is already flooding streets in Jamaica. It's packing sustained winds near 130 miles an hour. 
and some areas could get 40 inches of rain. Matthew stretches over hundreds of miles. Mark Streisman is in Kingston, Jamaica, where residents are bracing for the Category 4 hurricane. Mark, good morning. Good morning. Right now, we're between bands of rain as Matthew turns between Jamaica and Haiti to the east with millions of people in his projected path. It started raining here in Kingston yesterday afternoon, and forecasters say there's a lot more to come. Relentless downpours triggered floods as Hurricane Matthew hit Jamaica on Sunday. In Kingston, rushing water covered streets and stranded cars. Drivers braved knee-deep water, pushing vehicles down the road. <laughs> Off the western coast of the island near the city of Negril, a water spout was spotted over the ocean ahead of the storm. Officials issued an evacuation order throughout the island. All the models show that Jamaica will be within the 90% effect band of the storm. In Haiti, the slow-moving storm is expected to dump between 15 and 25 inches of rain. The government has opened roughly 1,300 emergency shelters that can hold up to 340,000 people. Matthew will make its way toward Cuba with hurricane conditions early tomorrow. The U.S. has already evacuated about 700 family members from the U.S. naval base in Guantanamo Bay. The State Department has advised non-essential personnel here in Jamaica, but also in Haiti and the Bahamas, to evacuate if they can, but at the very least, to hunker down. The impact in the U.S. is still unclear, forecasters say, but many of you living on the East Coast could start to feel it by the end of the week. Josh? Mark Strassman in Jamaica.